I'm Fred Charlton. I'm the fire chief with Clackamas Fire District Number One. Uh, Clackamas Fire currently protects about 220,000 residents over about 235 square miles. And we deliver uh, really great services from 20 community fire stations, respond about 24,000 times a year. And we do this with about 280 full-time employees and 80 community volunteers. Clackamas Fire has a long, rich history of uh, training and training for success. About 20 years ago, we identified the need to implement uh, techniques and tactics and equip our firefighters so that they could perform really self-rescue or get themselves out of a bad situation. And over the years, that's really evolved to where we are today in 2018. And looking back at September 6th, we took 20 years of training on how to save yourself and really turned it into how to save, save someone else. And what could have been a very tragic day could have been a line of duty death for a firefighter. Uh, it could have been a failure of equipment. It could have been the fatality of a, of a civilian turned into a story of success. And that success is due in part to our training and our philosophy in equipping our firefighters with the very best tools so that we can go out and execute uh, our job every day. Truck 308, head rescue 305 into 301 into 306, County 302, residential fire 9893 southeast top of Scott, map page of 5999 Boulevard frequency above 26, 9893 southeast top of Scott at 349. We work 24 hours a day on our shift and earlier in the day we had a two alarm fire. It was a super hot day in September. So we were really tired when the station tones went off at 3.49 in the morning. When I woke up for this fire, I just remember there being a little extra commotion about it. It was dispatched as a house fire, but with big play victims. I heard the address of Tapa Scott. I just happened to glance down at my phone as I was going to the rig and saw the map. We knew that it was just up the street and that we would be on our own for a while with all the other units responding. Battalion 302, truck 308. This is going to be the neighbor's residence from 993 Southeast Top of Scott. There's going to be a seat plane. The owner is outside of the residence. What are you saying there is a female inside? She should be upstairs on the back side of the house. Uh, pulling out is when we heard the reports from our dispatch that there was a potential victim trapped. Right this is when I made the corner out of the station. You could just see an orange glow through the roofs of the other houses. So when we pulled up, the house was set back off the street and there was obviously a huge volume of fire coming from the distance, but we couldn't get a good look at it. I'm thinking we're going to do a VES, which is vent inner search. And um, on the heavy rescue, that's kind of our bread and butter is the search and rescue stuff. And as I Build off the rig, I remember seeing that same glow that everyone had talked about with the fire and grabbed my tools and then went around the back and grabbed the ladder off the back of the heavy. Every few 305 to ride. We have a large house, long driveway back. Looks like slants to the roof. Right now, we'll be checking. Got to get a better look at it. And uh, NBC is down, so some of those could have to look up the map for hydrant information. Stand by for more. As I walked up, there was a gentleman in the front yard. Uh, we had a heavy body of fire, probably the front quarter of the house, and came up to the gentleman. He's got a garden hose uh, on the fire, doing a great job. And he mentioned to me that there was two cats inside and a lady in the back. And I remember thinking, that's a weird order to tell me that, but okay. And so I kind of just continued moving, kind of constant state of motion. I had a neighbor yelling at me to tell me that there's someone trapped inside. As I started to talk, I, had, I noticed there were two uh, female occupants that obviously had just gotten out of the house and were laying in the grass, and they were yelling at me also that there was someone still inside. All right, see, come on, let's get 305. We've got fire on the Alpha, all the Alpha, Bravo Corner of the building coming out of the front door all the way up into the 
roof. Two two patients down in the front yard. I think they're okay. They're saying there's one upstairs. Uh, I saw Matt doing a, a quick brief interview of the the gentleman with the garden hose trying to put the fire out, and so I completely skipped all of that process and went. I could kind of see them pointing to that Charlie Delta corner, that side yard, and so I just kept going to that spot, and he was just a few steps ahead of me, so I just followed Matt to there. So as we walked by, we walked by those great windows. We could see the giant great room, um, and so I got to that that slider and just kind of peeked in, and Scott's right behind me, Andrew's behind me, Kyle's behind me. We all kind of met right there. We were all standing at this back door to the house on the back side, which is the Charlie side. As a crew, we stood at the door and looked into the building and we could see that there was a chance that we could make it to that second floor. And as a four person crew, we're used to working split up. The two firefighters in the back, Matt and Scott, usually get split up and they become a team B. So if we were to go into a house and search, we would split up our team B, they would go to the first floor, team A would go to the second floor. Uh, Matt and Scott were able to get masked up and uh, get their hoods and everything on first. They were getting ready to go in, you know, consensus that it was, we were going to go in, not use the ladder, just try to make that stairwell. I handed Scott the, uh, the water can that I had brought up. I remember kind of looking in there and, and that was one of those moments where the, the Time's kind of going slow and fast in different points throughout this call, and that was one of those moments where it just all kind of slowed down, and I remember having this weird thought, like, oh, this, is, this is like Hollywood fire. There's tons of fire. Usually, typically, when there's a normal house fire, smoke to the floor. Um, in this circumstance, the fire had already kind of crawled up and through part of the roof, so it had a good flow path up, and there was just a lot of heat and fire, but mostly towards the front of the house. Because of the visibility and because of those conditions, we could make out that protected stairwell. Um, and so we kind of just decided, I think, rather than guess at windows and guess it at uh, rooms that she could possibly be in, if we can get up there and just get those rooms searched real quick, uh, that would be better. And then we'll, if we need to, we can uh, exit out a window or out the ladder. So kind of a reverse fin inner search, if you know. And as they made entry and went in to go to that second floor, Andrew and I were taking just 10, 15 seconds to put our masks on, put our hoods on, and which we were only about 20 seconds behind these guys. And our plan was we were going to follow them in and go with them to that second floor. Kyle and I were just about to start going up the stair when all the windows in that great room uh, the floor to ceiling. I don't know how many there were, but large windows uh, finally broke out from all the flames. Uh, so we had glass crashing, ceiling debris started falling on top of us. The conditions changed drastically and that fire had a clear ventilation path through that room which extended the fire right towards where we were trying to go. Uh, Kyle said, we need to back out and find another way in. As soon as we got up to that balcony area that was just off to the stairs, um, we did a quick search of that area. There was a bed there. And then for a brief moment, a little less focused on the rescue and then noticed, oh, this is pretty warm. And I remember thinking like, uh, that kind of a, the high heat kind of tingle on my ears and and uh, I remember having this weird sensation that the floor is almost kind of slippery and s like sticky and sluggish all at the same time and it ended up being that the, the carpet was coming up with my footsteps, it was sticking my boots. I remember thinking like, oh man, this is hot. Talking about it later, we had a lot of the same thoughts, not actually saying anything to each other, but thinking okay, I can feel this, this is a little more heat than, I'm, than I've had before. Um, to where we were thinking we're running out of our, our time um, that we think we gave ourselves and we're gonna have to start thinking about our exit. We proceeded down to the balcony, down towards the bedrooms, and I went 
to the first door that I came to and opened the door and surprisingly really good conditions in that bedroom, uh, just maybe a foot of light smoke down from the ceiling. And our fire victim was in there and she was conscious and maybe a little bit confused because it appeared that she was walking in circles. She had a washcloth to her mouth and um, was almost in disbelief. And I leaned back down out the, out the hallway because Matt had passed me at this point. Right then, uh, Scott, I hear Maddie, she's in here. And I just remember thinking, really? Just kind of in a little bit of disbelief. I remember there was almost kind of a moment of like, both of us were just in disbelief that it could have gone this quick and this easy. Like, wow, we just found her that fast. And so he came in and almost like shoved me aside or something to get in to like to see. I had to see her first. I couldn't, <laughs> I just kind of had to see her. And there was so there was a short hallway into that room and then she was on the bed. As he passed, I remember thinking um, earlier that summer we had, Andy and I had taken a, an advanced VES class and I remember one of the things they really pounded into our memory in that class was control the door, control that space, keep the heat and the smoke and everything outside of it. So we shut that door, um, went in into the room. We didn't even really have to assess her because she didn't look injured. She just very patiently sat down on the edge of the bed and let us do our thing. So our plan was we're going to isolate ourselves there, make sure she's good. We'll clear this window. They can't be far behind us. I remember thinking that I needed to make some radio communication, let people know what was going on, where we're at. Uh, I went to get my radio mic keyed up and I'm, I remember hearing a couple honks, um, which means that someone else is using the radio. And I remember getting pretty frustrated that I couldn't get on it. And at one point, I basically decided that I'm going to say what I got to say. Hopefully they're done talking and this is going to transmit. Unfortunately, all we heard was garble, 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 uh, second floor ladder. And as we walked up to this house initially, um, all, all four of us each grabbed a, a piece of equipment and one of them was a ladder. Just the 10 seconds we backed out, we went straight up that ladder, climbed up that roof, realized that particular location did not access the same spot these guys were at. Looked back to where we just came from in that great room and it was, you could call it fully involved, that whole room had flashed. And that's when Kyle and I looked at each other like, where are they? So as an officer, this is, this is when the panic was starting to set in and I was starting to get on the radio and call incoming units to make sure we knew that everyone knew where we were in this house and what we were doing and that we needed help, we needed a hose line, and more importantly, I wanted to communicate with Scott and Matt and figure out what the conditions were like where they were. Rescue mode. Why don't you go ahead and start me a second alarm on this? Rescue mode, second alarm. And then Matt and I just proceeded to clear the window. And I remember it was just bulls in a china shop. We just blew that TV out of the way. There was no taking good care of, of the, the person's belongings, which we normally do. We just knew that we needed to get going. And I remember thinking as Scott's calling for a ladder, I'm looking outside and there's no one there but I see a ladder, an extension ladder laying on the ground. And I just couldn't get it out of my head at that point. Why is that ladder laying there and why isn't someone attached to it and getting it to us so that we can get out of here? Um, come to find out it was a homeowner's ladder and I just started to see the fire had made it uh, through the top of the door. So I said to Scott, hey, we're gonna lose this room. And I looked back into the, where the door was and there was already kind of start, fire starting to kind of finger across the ceiling. Scott immediately said, okay, we're gonna to have to bail. And the first thing again that came to my mind was, really? Luckily for me, there were, I believe for both of us, there was no hesitation. Um, the second I saw that, I knew we weren't going out that way. I remember being frustrated that there wasn't a ladder there. I'd called for a ladder. 
I got on the radio and um, called that we were going to have to bail out. Basically, at that point, it was just, there was no hesitation. We had trained a whole bunch earlier that summer. We had helped teach the rest of the department on how to use the system. I was super comfortable on it. And bailing out is just not something that most people do in their career. And so I remember my first thought being, wow, okay, uh, here we go. As we looked up, uh, glass broke out of the second floor window and uh, as an officer and a crew with these guys, we're all really close. And to know that they were at the window and they broke the glass out and I knew engine 301 was coming with a ladder and they should be here any second. Um, it was a, a huge relief to see that they were okay in that second floor window. The window was clear. I hooked the, the lower right hand corner of the window with my bailout hook and did kind of a head first rollout. And that fortunately just put me in a perfect position where my knees and my feet were up against the siding of the building. And uh, I just basically leaned back into my harness and against the system. And that put me in a body position where my head's about even with the bottom of the window sill. So he went out, I looked back, Dee's still doing great. So uh, I go back and get her motioning like this for them and, and I was doing that and I was looking up at him I could see an orange glow above their heads and uh, he brought her to the window and just used this kind of just hand I can't remember if it was on her head or her shoulder but just kind of pushed her upper body out the window and it rolled her in the perfect body position right out into my lap she just rolled in my lap didn't feel awkward and she didn't feel like she was gonna fall or anything I just basically just cradled her on my lap at that point, Matt rolled out. My feeling once I got out was uh, safe. I, we're good. As soon as, even though we were on our hooks and we were hanging there, that was my first feeling of we're good. I, we could hang here all day long. This is no problem now. Seeing that both of these guys who we were really worried about at this point you know, and that whole, from the time we made entry up to that room to the time they're hanging there, I mean, we're only talking a couple minutes. And having Matt hanging out safely, Scott safe, victim safe and obviously okay, um, alert and talking to him and helping out even. Um, I radioed back to the incoming units and the battalion chief responding. I said, Wanted to let everyone know that everyone's safe out of the window. Um, we've got the victim, but we still need medical and we need help to this Delta side of the building. I've got two firefighters from 305. They are second window with a live victim. Everybody's safe. And we're right now going down the Delta side. We need an ambulance for that Alpha Delta corner. Thank goodness engine one had just arrived and brought uh, the extension ladder uh, from the A side right around to us. That delta side, it was on a sloped hill, so it was pretty good off camber, so that ladder was wanting to slip. And it was a very short setback uh, with a, a chain link fence to the neighbor's side. So there wasn't a whole lot of adjusting we could do for the, the ladder angle. Uh, so Kyle had to hold it up really hard so that it wouldn't slip off as I went up the ladder. We got the victim from Scott's lap onto the ladder and I wasn't sure what kind of condition she was in. I thought I was going to have to carry her down but she was actually able to walk down on her own. I just went down first and, and guided her down. After the victim came down the ladder with help and was walked out to our medical team who was waiting on that front side of the building Matt and Scott were still hanging from the windowsill on their ropes, and um, Scott came down first, rappelled down the building, his feet touched the ground, he was safe, still hooked to the building with his rope. I remember having this sen like, sense of almost like, not panic, but I didn't like being attached to the building still. And it was all I could do to get that carabiner unhooked from my harness as fast as I could. And as soon as I hit the ground, uh, Kyle 
comes over and dog piles, dog piles us and, and he comes over and, and right then I'm thinking, I can't believe that that just happened. This was seven minutes ago, I was dead asleep and how did that go so fast and now I'm laying on the ground and Kyle comes over and he can see in my eyes just trying to process it and, and I see his eyes through his mask and he just goes, yeah, and I think that was a, I'm glad you're okay. I think that was a kind of a, it was a thing for him as much as it was for me, but that was something for me that it, it snapped me out and went, yeah, we're okay, we're back together. The sense of relief I had at that point was, uh, I, I, I couldn't believe what had just happened for one. I was really, really excited to see that they were okay and huge relief for me. I have every confidence in their abilities and when we when we split teams and we I send guys these guys in in and they have to work by themselves um, I know that they they're capable and um, they're ready to do this and um, they've we've worked together for a long time they know each other really really well all four of us do um, so it's a perfect situation for uh, the two guys that I was able to send into this house and feel comfortable doing so. You know, when we regrouped, we unhooked the ropes and we walked as a crew back to that front side. I, uh, I knew I had to go out and talk to the battalion chief waiting in the street and tell him that we're okay. And um, we just, I just decided we we're gonna take a break, sit in that front of that house, regroup, and let the other, by this time, all the other crews had showed up and hose lines were being pulled and um, patients in the ambulance. Um, at that point, we needed to just sit together and relax for a second. I guess one thing I really want to say on that fire is two times on the same fire, I've never seen fire conditions change so fast from the, the time they went in to the 15 to 20 seconds later that we tried to follow, that whole room flashed and, and made it so we, you know we couldn't follow. And if we would have pushed up to that stairwell, we would have been the ones that were in trouble. And then from them bailing out that window, just the, the few flames that were coming across that ceiling seemed like the second mat rolled out, that whole room flashed and flames were actually shooting out the window. So, you know, a couple times on the same call that mere seconds mattered and if they hadn't bailed out and would have kept waiting for the ladder then she surely would have you know burned and succumbed to those injuries so you know proud of the people I work with and it was a, a nerve-wracking call but you know the the outcome you know outweighs all that so the biggest thing for me was about this call was just how fast time compressed and how there was no time to really think about everything it was very action oriented for me um, fortunately we had done a bunch of training earlier that summer um, we trained with searching a lot and there was not a whole lot of slowly trying to come up with a plan and talk about stuff it was all very action oriented and that was my big takeaway from it was just how important it is to train and have that muscle memory to just do what you have to do when that time comes. And I remember being really grateful for that and not having to think my way through it and just do it. For this, um, again, this entire call happened from the time we woke up from being dead asleep in the fire station with station tones till the time our patient was out and the guys had bailed out and gotten her out was, um, and according to the dispatch notes, not more than six or seven minutes. And so this, is, this was a huge deal for us and uh, I'm really, really proud of our crew and the fire department and everyone that helped uh, come in and back us up because we needed help that night. But, Really excited about how this whole thing went down, but mostly just relieved that no one got hurt. They have not made the words for me to thank you. It's our pleasure. You have no idea that how I feel and if I 
come out from the backside where they do. And that's all there is to it. You risk your life for me. Somebody you didn't even know. And appreciation. It's not about just me. It's about them and their training and their fire department and working well together. And I definitely, if you don't say anything else, you tell folks that.